It's now 2 p.m. I'm you. afraid. Sorry about that, Senator Ayres. You'll be in continuation. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Yesterday, Mr. Morrison said, and I quote, The challenge of JobKeeper is that businesses will form views about those employees who they will able to be able to keep on longer term and those who they will not. How many Australians does the Prime Minister expect will lose their jobs and be left behind when he withdraws JobKeeper at the end of September? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, the, the government doesn't want any Australian to be left behind, but it is also true that we will not be able to provide crisis-level temporary support through a program like JobKeeper uh, forever and ever. Forever and ever. I mean, the, uh, the uh, focus uh, for, the, for the country surely must be, the commitment uh, for the country surely must be for us to get back into a situation as soon as possible where businesses around Australia are able to pay the wages of their employees out of their income uh, rather than on the basis of uh, crisis level temporary fiscal support. Now, uh, Mr. President, you know, clearly we, we've been hit with a one in a hundred year uh, global pandemic that has had devastating impacts on our economy and on jobs. Uh, and, you know, we provided crisis level support. Uh, the next important decision is how we most appropriately transition uh, into the strongest possible recovery on the other side. And the government will continue to make responsible decisions order. in Senator that Wong context. A point of order. Point of order. The Prime Minister made a statement yesterday, and the question went to how many people he thinks will lose their jobs, as he contemplates in his statement. I'll ask the Minister to be directly relevant to the question. On the point of order? Well, the, the question directly uh, asked uh, actually how many uh, Australians uh, the government uh, intends to leave behind, and I directly answered that by making, by, uh, by making the point that the government doesn't want any Australian to be left behind, and will continue um, to provide. I'll, I'll take so I was it, directly relevant. Uh, on the point of order, I do consider the Minister to be directly relevant. There's an opportunity to debate the merits of answers after question time. Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. The Australian people know that we uh, made uh, the best possible decisions in a set of very difficult circumstances to provide uh, transitional support to keep as many businesses in business, as many Australians in jobs as possible, and to provide enhanced support to those Australians who, through no fault of their own, lost their job. Uh, and and that, is, that is indeed what we've done. It was always clear that this would be a temporary arrangement, and the Australian people would, would expect us to help facilitate the strongest possible recovery as soon as possible so that all Australians, all Australians have the best possible opportunity to get ahead. And if they cannot continue uh, in uh, their job that they had before COVID, in their current uh, business that they work for, then we've got to make sure we create the uh, conditions where they can find a new and better job in another business. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. There are already 140,000 more people on Job Seeker than the government predicted for the month of June. How many more Australians does the government believe will join the 1.65 million already on Job Seeker when Mr. Morrison snaps back Job Keeper in September? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, you know, firstly, I reject the premise of the question. Um, what, I, what, I, what, I would, what I what I would say, what I what I what I would say is the government will continue to work uh, to maximise the strength of the recovery on the other side. The government will continue to make responsible uh, decisions, and the government will continue to ensure that all Australians have the best possible opportunity uh, to get back into work if they've lost their jobs, or to ensure that they can have. Uh, I, uh, to ensure that they can um, have a job in a business that is viable over the long term uh, if that business indeed is not able to recover post-COVID. Senator Wong, a final supplementary Thank question. You. Digital Finance Analytics has warned that as many as 100,000 Australian households will default on their mortgages when JobKeeper is removed in September, with more than 5 million Australians and their families currently relying on direct government support. Why is Mr Morrison continue continuing to insist on a flawed snapback strategy which will leave millions of Australians behind during the country's first recession in 29 years? Senator uh, th thank you very much, Mr uh, President. Uh, you know, Senator Wong can repeat false assertions uh, to scare people as often as she wants. It doesn't make them come true. What the government has said is that JobKeeper will remain in place for six months and that we will continue to make responsible decisions on how 
to most appropriately transition uh, into the strongest possible economic recovery on the other side. There is a review currently underway, uh, which uh, is uh, well publicised by Treasury. Uh, Treasury uh, will be putting advice and recommendations to the government, and the government will continue to make responsible decisions as we have uh, over the last few months, as we've been dealing with, an un with, a, with a one in a hundred year uh, global pandemic and devastating impacts on the Australian economy. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Minister, can you outline for the Senate how the Morrison government's plan for a stronger economy is guaranteeing essential services, including by maintaining and improving capacity in our health system throughout the course of the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator McGrath for his question. Mr. President, in what has been one of the most intense periods in Australia's history, our health system has performed remarkably well. It has been, by all assessments, the envy of the world with the way it has been able to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. The way that our primary care system has responded to COVID-19 has been outstanding. Our doctors, our nurses, our pharmacists, supported of course now by telehealth. Our hospitals, where our hospital workers, our carers, our cleaners, our administrators, they have worked tirelessly to manage the cases that have arisen and increase our capacity to respond to the COVID-19 outbreak. And Mr President, I'm pleased to advise that in relation to our aged care network, as of yesterday, there are no active cases of COVID-19 in any aged care facilities in Australia. As of yesterday, we have now reduced the number of people in hospital because of COVID-19 to 17, and the number in ICU is now at four. Australians have also seen the positive results of our testing regime and our collective success in flattening the curve. Our testing regime has now seen over 1.8 million tests conducted across Australia. Of those, 7,335 Australians approximately have been diagnosed with COVID-19, and sadly, as we know, 102 have lost their lives. The rate of positive returns has now dropped to 0.4 per cent across the 1.8 million tests, and of those, 62 per cent of cases have come from overseas. Mr President, as a result of Australians working together to suppress COVID-19, our health system and those Order. who work tirelessly in it— Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. As the government has responded to the COVID-19 pandemic, how has the government continued to invest in our health system to ensure it is resourced and ready for future challenges? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, throughout the course of COVID-19, uh, the Morrison government has continued to ensure that Australia's health system capacity will meet future challenges. We have reached a new hospital, national hospital reform agreement with the states and territories. Under this new agreement, the Commonwealth will increase its investment from $100 billion to $131 billion. At the same time, we are delivering a new five-year community pharmacy agreement that expands remuneration for the dispensing of subsidised PBS medicines, community pharmacy medication management programs and services to $18.349 billion over the five years of the agreement. Mr President, this is up $1.5 billion compared to the sixth community pharmacy agreement. Again, Australians can be assured that throughout the COVID-19 crisis, the Morrison government continues to invest Order. in the Senator health Cash. system. Senator McGrath, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate how this work has improved access to medicines? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, I think this is one of the great success stories of the Morrison government. That is, of course, as a government, we continue to make more medicines available for patients on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. Since 2013, because of our strong economic management, our government has approved now more than 2,400 new or amended listings on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. This represents an average of around 30 medicine listings or amendments per month or one each day, at an overall investment by the government of $11.6 
billion. Mr President, Australians with asthma and multiple myeloma will have broader access to life-changing medicines as a result of expanded medicines listings on the PBS scheme from 1 June 2020. Our government, the Morrison government, we are committed to ensuring that Australians that need to access affordable medicines Order. Senator are Cash, able time to, to the do so. Expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Does the government remain committed to withdrawing the coronavirus supplement in September? And what is the minister's advice to the 2.3 million Australians who will be $550 per fortnight worse off? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Senator Gallagher, for her question about what has been an extraordinarily important issue uh, over the last three months and a very important supplement that has been in place to help those people who find themselves without a job during a time when the job market is effectively closed. Um, we have supercharged our safety net to assist people who find themselves unemployed uh, because and during a time of completely unprecedented unemployment uh, pressure on our market. But we said at the time, and we remain committed, to temporary, targeted, time-limited measures to help Australians to get through the crisis that is before us. We always said that our measures that we put in place, not just the coronavirus supplement, but many other measures that this government put in place to make sure that we could assist Australians who were immediately impacted um, and, and um, with a, an impact that came about um, in the most extraordinary circumstances, that we've supported them through this time. We remain committed to supporting Australians uh, during the coronavirus crisis, but we also remain um, committed to making sure that we put our economy back on track. Um, but, uh, so in answer to your question, uh, the time limit determined messages, uh, um, uh, measures have been put in place to meet the extraordinary circumstances of the coronavirus pandemic. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you. The 2.3 million Australians include hundreds of thousands of students, widows, farmers and parents. How many of the 2.3 million does the government th think are lifters and how many are leaners? Senator Rustin. Mm. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. President. What I can tell the Senator uh, in response to her question is that this government is absolutely committed, always has been from the day that we became aware that we were faced with this absolutely enormous crisis that was before us that became very evident in February, is that we were going to work with the Australian public, we were going to work with the Australian community. In fact, we were even working with the, uh, the Australian federal opposition and the oppositions and the governments in the states and territories around Australia so that we could all work together. So we we could support all Australians through this crisis. And in doing so, in doing so, one of the most important things that we can do as a government is to make sure that our economy is supported so that jobs are recreated, so that we can get people who are currently unemployed back into employment as quickly as possible. And that's exactly what the focus of this government has been right the way through. Support people during the time when there was unemployment, but to make sure the jobs are recreated so they can get back to work as soon as possible. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr President. Department Department of Social Services figures show that the coronavirus um, supplement will be providing at least $2.6 billion per month in direct fiscal support in September. Why is the government insisting on a $2.6 billion per month hit to the economy during Australia's first recession in 29 years? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, the Australian government, the Morrison government, the coalition government is absolutely committed to putting the right measures into our economy to make sure two very clear things happen. One is that we support Australians who need our support during this time, and the other one is to make sure that we get the economy kick started on the other side of this so that we can actually have the jobs so people can go back. Um, those opposite would know, uh, those opposite seem to think that they have got to, uh, some some sort of claim on monetary and fiscal policy within the economy. If they'd like to have a look at Economics 101, you'd actually realise there are many ways that you can stimulate an economy, whether it's through fiscal or monetary policy. Um, and, and as uh, Senator Smith behind Order. me said, reducing the tax burden. I mean, for some reason, you seem absolutely fixated on particular things that you might think are the only way to stimulate the economy. Well, we on this side know that you have to have a suite of measures, a full package, to make sure that you Order. are taking a holistic approach to looking after all Australians. Order. Order. I will call the next question.
Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Environment Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, the Prime Minister announced plans to cut environmental laws to fast track assessments of developments and mining projects. This plan cuts corners and removes vital checks on the impact projects will have on our environment. Why is your government weakening protection for the environment that will put Australia's forests, our beaches, our native animals and our ancient historical sites at further risk? The Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Hanson Young for her question. Although I do reject uh, many of the claims that Senator Hanson Young has made in that, uh, in that question, Mr. President. Uh, what our government takes pride in doing is upholding environmental laws, but making sure that we don't strangle economic activity in a morass of green tape and indecision and lack of progress in terms of analysing and assessing the applications that come before us. So, our government. Minister for the Environment, President, has worked hard to make sure that decision making is more efficient and effective. That's something that should be applauded around this place. Now, rather than projects sitting there waiting, not knowing whether they're approved or not approved, we actually are backing them to get through the pipeline. Where conditions need to be applied, they're applied. Where they need to be rejections, they're rejected. But, Mr. President, what the Prime Minister announced yesterday was a $25 million investment in specialist project teams, new approaches to information sharing between the Commonwealth and states to reduce backlogs, to reduce the time taken for assessments, to make sure that there is less duplication of assessments between the Commonwealth and the states. This is simply about making our environmental regulation more efficient, more effective, so that it can serve its purpose of protecting our environment and our biodiversity and our conservation needs but that it doesn't strangle economic development, and particularly at a point of time in our nation when we want to make sure that those investments that can go ahead do go ahead. We want to make sure that those who are willing to put money on the table and to make projects happen that will generate jobs for Australians, that that goes ahead wherever possible, wherever it is not in breach of our environmental laws, not that it sits somewhere in the backdrop for years just waiting for somebody to make a decision. We're not afraid to make decisions, but we will make sure we make the right decisions for our environment and for the jobs of Australians. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Thank you. Australia has already lost one million hectares of koala habitat because of the weak environmental laws in place. Koalas in some areas are now endangered. Minister, you have pledged to uphold environmental laws. Will you guarantee that not one more hectare of koala habitat will be destroyed under your plans. Senator Birmingham. Well, thank you. Well, thanks, Mr. President. I'm sure, I'm sure Senator Hanson Young does actually know that across different parts of Australia uh, there are indeed uh, different areas of habitat for koala species uh, and quite different population trends in, uh, in those different parts of Australia as well. So Senator Hanson Young invites me to come in here and give some blanket guarantee about koalas overall and not one more hectare, without acknowledging the fact that in different parts of the country there are absolutely strong, vibrant populations of koalas that we want to see continue to be strong and vibrant populations. But that's not to say that there can't be complementary developments, particularly of a tourism nature or the like, that can ensure sustainable activity in those communities and continue to preserve uh, koala populations and habitat as is necessary. And that's the careful balancing act that we commit to undertaking to make sure we preserve uh, those most important species for Australians, but also that we ensure Australians have jobs as well. Order. Senator Patrick, oh, sorry, Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister guarantee that fast-tracking approvals for mines and projects will not result in any more blasting of ancient historical sites, such as the destruction of a 46,000-year-old sacred site in WA last month by Rio Tinto. Will you fix the laws to guarantee that this type of environmental vandalism will never, ever occur again? Senator Birmingham. Thank, th thanks, Mr. President. I know it suits the agenda for the Australian Greens to come in and to, of course, make everything you know, the fault of uh, the government standing here, to ignore completely the reality of decision making that might be the responsibility of state or territory governments, uh, to figure that the EPBC Act is somehow a one stop shop for every form of protection to occur. Uh, but 
The truth lies elsewhere. It certainly doesn't lie in the picture painted uh, by the Australian Greens. Uh, now, Mr. President, uh, I in no way uh, condone uh, unnecessary destruction of heritage, particularly of Indigenous heritage, uh, which has a crucial role to play uh, in sectors such as our tourism industry uh, and, of course, uh, is so important in terms of preserving the culture uh, of our first Australians. But, Mr President, um, I won't take uh, lectures from the Australian Greens or suggestions that somehow the policies of this government uh, are to fault or are to blame uh, for actions or decisions of state or territory Order, governments Senator and their Birmingham. regulatory authorities. Senator Patrick. To do what you don't is to Order. Leave. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Finance and Concerns, Government Procurement and Expenditure. Austender shows that since 2016, the construction giant Lendlease has won federal contracts worth more than $661 million, the overwhelming, uh, overwhelmingly for Defence Department construction. In addition, the Defence Minister announced in April this year the award of further contracts valued at $365 million, bringing Lendlease's total haul to over $1 billion. Is it not the case that the tax officer's uh, tax transparency reports show that the five years from 2013-14 to 2017-18, Lendlease generated $43 billion in revenue, generated a, pro a profit before tax of more than $5 billion, but didn't pay a cent in corporate income tax. Are you aware that the company's own reports further show that they paid no income tax in 1819 and don't expect to pay some for any uh, some any time yet? How do you reconcile awarding billions of dollars of contracts to corporate giants that pay no Order. corporate tax? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, every business in Australia that makes uh, taxable income uh, has to comply with uh, Australian uh, tax laws and pay and pay uh, income tax according to our laws. I'm not going to discuss the tax affairs of individual uh, taxpayers. That wouldn't be appropriate. Uh, furthermore, I mean, you do know, of course, that tender decisions are not made uh, by uh, the government of the day. They're made following a proper, rigorous uh, tender process, uh, appropriately at arm's length from uh, the government of the day. I think you would expect that to happen uh, based on a proper assessment of the relative merits of uh, specific uh, proposals in Australia. Uh, we, you know, in, businesses are not taxed on their revenue, they're taxed based on their taxable income and uh, you know, on that basis, of course, every business must comply with our tax laws. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The government's own figures and announcements show that Lendlease has been awarded more, nearly $800 million in contracts this year, 2020, and it's only June. In these circumstances, why is Lendlease allowed to access the JobKeeper program to pay some 15 per cent nearly 1,400 members of its 9,200 Australian workforce when it seems flush with contracts. contracts. Um, how do you justify uh, this company milking taxpayers' money when they pay no corporate tax? Order. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. Uh, I, I don't accept the premise of the question. I mean, the uh, terms and conditions on which uh, businesses can access uh, support through the JobKeeper program are well known for businesses with a turnover of less than a billion dollars. It uh, requires a 30 per cent drop uh, in, in turnover. For businesses uh, with a turnover of more than a billion, it has, you know, there is a uh, bigger test, a higher test, a more difficult test. Indeed, they've got to demonstrate a 50 per cent drop uh, in turnover. So, uh, again, I'm not going to talk about the specific affairs of individual businesses or individual taxpayers. That would be inappropriate. But, uh, but in the broad, uh, the um, terms and conditions on which uh, individual businesses can access uh, that program, which has supported uh, you know, more than three million Australian workers, uh, are of course uh, the same for everyone. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, to the Finance Minister, uh, the information I'm talking about uh, in relation to income tax comes from tax transparency data published by the ATO on Lendlease. Why is the government comfortable in awarding billions of dollars of, of contracts to a company, Lendlease? That has not paid a brass razu in corporate tax for well over five years. Senator Cormann. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I refer uh, Senator Patrick to my first answer to the primary question. 
uh, we expect uh, all uh, Australian businesses to comply with our tax laws and uh, to pay um, corporate tax or relevant taxes, you know, corporate tax in this uh, instance in relation to their taxable income. Now, if you uh, have a, uh, if, if, if the suggestion in your question is uh, that somehow this business that you're referencing has broken the law, uh, then I would uh, encourage you to make relevant uh, reports uh, to uh, compliance authorities, to law enforcement authorities. Uh, you know, if a business that complies with the law, laws and uh, employs many, many Australians, complies with the laws and provides, of course, uh, you know, important services uh, to Australia, of course, if they win on merit uh, a tender, I don't think that you would suggest that we should politically interfere in preventing a business from uh, taking on a tender that they've won uh, based on a proper competition and assessment at arm's length from government. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Yesterday, the Minister said that Home Builder would be, and I quote, directly supporting 140,000 tradies and a further up to 1 million jobs indirectly in the residential construction sector. ASIC estimates there are 1,183,000 people employed in the entire construction sector last year. Does the minister stand by his claim that every single construction job in the country will be supported by Home Builder? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Thank you Corbyn. very much, Mr President. I, I, would, I would encourage Senator Gallagher to reflect on the words directly and indirectly, uh, and indeed I stand by my answer. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Order. Thank you, Mr. President. My uh, supplementary question is, what is the total value of private investment that the government expects to generate through the Home Builder program? Senator Cormann. Um, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I think I've gone through all this uh, in some uh, detail uh, yesterday. Um, <laughs> I've gone through this uh, in some detail yesterday. We expect uh, that about uh, 27,000 projects will be supported through this program. Uh, the terms and conditions of this program uh, are well known and uh, you know, we'll report on it on the other side uh, of uh, this period uh, that has been in place. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, does the government believe that Home Builder will fully offset the projected decline in the residential construction sector employment. Senator uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, it, this is not a program that operates on its own. I mean, this is a program that will make an important contribution to supporting workers in the residential construction sector, and of course, in a number of states, uh, and, and uh, in a number of states, state jurisdictions will be complementing this scheme. Uh, and and I, I can see, I can see that the Labor Party clearly doesn't like uh, supporting. Uh, supporting workers in the residential construction sector doesn't doesn't like doesn't like uh, supporting workers in the residential uh, construction order. sector. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order. What we don't like is ministers misleading That's about their numbers. Necessary. That's Senator what we don't Wong, like. You know better than well, that on a point of order. I didn't hear a reflection or imputation there. I must say, I'll call Senator Cormann to continue. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. You know, we will continue to do uh, what we have been doing. We'll continue to make decisions to support working families around Australia. We let the Labor Party continue to do what they're doing. We let you continue to throw verbal rocks, verbal rocks at the government. We'll just get on with the job. Senator Molan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister outline some of the support measures the Morrison government is implementing to support the tourism industry in response to the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Molan for, uh, for his question. Uh, as was clear from the release of yesterday's overseas arrivals and departures data, uh, there's no industry in Australia that would be suffering any more or, frankly, has been suffering for any longer period of time this year than our tourism industry. And tourism operators right across the country deserve uh, the thanks of everyone for the sacrifices they, along with so many others, uh, are making uh, to help ensure our country stays safe at present, uh, particularly given the burden that is falling upon them as a result of the necessary uh, closure of international travel uh, borders uh, into Australia. Uh, as senators know and, uh, and indeed debate and contest, uh, the $260 billion package of economic support measures we've got in place uh, is playing 
a crucial role in supporting many of those tourism industry businesses and their employees at present. Now, those assistance measures range across the small business payments uh, that we are making uh, to those many businesses, particularly family-owned small and medium-sized businesses in the tourism space. Uh, we've provided as well aviation industry support, financing solutions and, of course, JobKeeper payments uh, that are supporting so many different parts of the tourism sector. We've also stepped in where there are additional fixed and specific costs in businesses that were they to go under it could threaten the viability of a tourism region or ecosystem. In particular, I give the example of our $94 million package for exhibiting zoos and aquariums. Uh, this is an important package that acknowledges that in those businesses, whilst JobKeeper uh, measures may be helping with staff costs, whilst rent relief may be helping with other costs, uh, whilst the small business payments may be helping with other normal ongoing costs, there are high fixed additional costs uh, that we've provided support for in terms of the care and treatment of animals and ensuring the welfare of those animals uh, within those, uh, those important tourism attractions uh, across our many regions and cities of Australia. Senator Moll on a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate how the government's plan for a stronger economy, including record and growing infrastructure investment, continues to support the tourism industry? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, while these are dark days for our tourism operators, we are determined to support our tourist regions in particular to be ready to capitalise as states and territories reopen travel within and across uh, their states and ultimately uh, for when we do get back to hosting many millions of international visitors to our country again. In the 2019-20 budget, our government announced a further $200 million towards a fourth round of the Building Better Regions Fund. Uh, which has brought that fund and program to an excess of $800 million of investment. It's in addition to programs like our $50 million Tourism Icons program. And just a fortnight ago, uh, our government announced 163 successful projects under round four of the BBRF, and many of those support crucial tourism infrastructure in the regions across Australia. In my home state of South Australia, for example, the Silver to Seaway, uh, finishing in Port Pirie, a crucial development in Senator Molan's in New South Wales, the Condoblin Tourism Precinct, offering uh, the banks of Lachlan Border, River Senator in Western Birmingham, New South Wales enhanced tourism. Expired. Senator Molan, a final supplementary question. Uh, how is the government encouraging Australians to visit and support bushfire impacted regions in my home state of New South Wales? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, uh, no, uh, no senator in this place I think, has greater appreciation and understanding of the impact the bushfires had in, uh, in parts of New South Wales than Senator Molan, uh, and, uh, and I thank you for your advocacy for many regions in, uh, in those parts of New South Wales. Uh, we, of course, uh, initiated various tourism campaigns before COVID-19 hit to try to encourage travel across those regions, and we stand ready to recommence those as uh, border restrictions and travel advisories allow. Such campaigns showed off the stunning Glasshouse Rocks in Naruma, uh, alongside an interview with, uh, with zookeeper Chad from the Featherside Sydney Wildlife Park and the Mogo Zoo. Uh, we've made sure that we've promoted 10 country towns near Sydney that people should take a day trip to this winter, uh, which featured the southern highlands, Berrima and Barrel, and the south coast, Jamboree and Kiama. Uh, the best spots for beach camping in New South Wales, which showcased Eurobedella's Mystery Bay and Mamusa Rocks National Park's Picnic Point. Uh, the Snowy Mountains also featured in our Live from Order, Australia Senator campaign. Birmingham. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence. On the 19th of March 2020, the Minister confirmed that at least one incident of alleged war crimes from Afghanistan has been referred to the AFP. The Inspector General ADF confirmed in his annual report that George Brereton is investigating 55 separate incidents, many of which may also lead to referral to the AFP. In the interim, families of affected ADF or former ADF members have told me they are being provided internal ADF legal support through Defence Council Services for the IGADF inquiry. But what terrifies them is the uncertainty surrounding funding available to pay for expensive criminal trials flowing from that inquiry. If provided, this funding would be made pursuant to a policy known as legal assistance at Commonwealth expense, which is discretionary. Members have no certainty that they will get the legal representation that they need for a fair trial. Is the minister aware that, because of this uncertainty, many of those under investigation are now contemplating mortgaging their family homes or commencing public GoFundMe pages to fund their criminal defence teams? Order. Senator Reynolds, the Minister for Defence. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Lambie for raising this very important issue. And before coming to the specifics of this question and uh, the letter I provided you in response to this uh, to this issue, can I just say to all in this chamber that it is well known that this inquiry is underway. It is an extensive and a very complex inquiry involving incredibly serious subject matters, and many witnesses and lines of inquiry have occurred. Now, in the course of uh, this inquiry, um, I, I did table the Inspector General ADF's uh, annual report uh, a few months ago, which did uh, make very clear the serious nature of uh, the inquiries uh, under, uh, under review by him. The Chief of Defence Force has advised me that the inquiry report will be handed to him uh, in coming months. He will then consider its findings and, with my close oversight, will determine the actions uh, required in consultation with the IGADF. Now, where there are serious rumours and allegations raised about the conduct of our ADF members, Australians would rightly expect that they are thoroughly examined according to the rigorous and well-established processes that are in place. Australians would, of course, also expect all ADF members to be treated with the utmost fairness throughout these processes and also, of course, their family members. Now, in relation to the specific issue that Senator Lambie has raised with me, uh, I can confirm that uh, legal support will be provided, and I'm currently discussing that with the Chief of Defence Force and also the Attorney General on how that uh, will occur. But at all times during the conduct of the inquiry and through its conclusion to the next phases, a range of legal, psychological, medical, pastoral and social work support services continue to be made available to inquiry witnesses and other individuals impacted. Order, Senator Reynolds. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. When Australian ADF personnel last faced similar prosecutions in 2010, the then Chief of Defence Force, Angus Hewson, told this Senate that no expense will be spared to fund the defence of soldiers facing prosecution. Will the minister, like she just hasn't then, give a commitment and confirm that it is her expectation that legal assistance at Commonwealth expense will be afforded to any ADF or former ADF member facing criminal prosecutions from their service in Afghanistan, including funding lawyers of their choice? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, as I said, Senator Lambie uh, has uh, Senator Lambie, you have raised this previously with me, and I have also confirmed uh, these matters with you in writing. Uh, but for the benefit of all senators, I want to be very clear that throughout the inquiry, the IGADF has worked well in establishing the processes to ensure that witnesses are provided with access to legal support. And I, as I confirmed in writing to Senator Lambie, it is a long-standing position that current and former serving ADF members can apply for Commonwealth financial assistance for civil or criminal legal proceedings that they are involved in. And if the proceedings arise out of an incident relating to their service with defence and that they have acted responsibly and reasonably, uh, then this will be provided. Uh, Senator Lambie, and as I have just uh, restated, is it is absolutely my intent to ensure, and it is the CDF's intent to ensure, that those who are caught up in this Order. process Senator Reynolds, uh, do, do, get the, do continue to get expired. the support. Thank Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The word discretionary. Let's go again. The IGADF state on their website that defence cares about the welfare of all personnel involved in the <coughs> Afghanistan inquiry. We know the AFP investigating now, and the Commonwealth has already appointed a prosecutor. What I'm hearing is that many ADF members strongly feel that this commitment to their welfare is nothing more than lip service. And if the minister is refusing to guarantee legal assistance, then what is the minister going to do? to ensure that ADF members are placed on an even footing and get a fair bloody trial like they deserve. I urge senators to watch their language in the chamber about what is parliamentary, Senator Lambie. One can be passionate and we might use parliamentary language. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And as I've said, I've already stated twice uh, the support that is being required it is being provided and will continue to be required. But Senator Lambie has raised a prior precedent in relation to this matter. And can I emphasise to all in this place that this earlier matter that Senator Lambie uh, quotes is not a precedent in the current circumstances. And the IGADF annual report makes it very clear that the Afghanistan inquiry is not focused on conduct that occurred in the heat of battle. Uh, and so that is a very important uh, differentiator in this circumstance. But as has been provided throughout this process, 
uh, all legal, psychological uh, and family support has been provided and will continue to be provided. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Last month, the Prime Minister promised that all bushfire-affected properties in New South Wales will be cleared of debris by the end of June. Will Mr Morrison keep his promise? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. As I'm sure uh, Senator Watt would know, uh, it is actually the New South Wales state government that is doing uh, the uh, job on the ground, supported by the federal government, which is, which is uh, providing 50 per cent uh, of the uh, funding for, to uh, pay for the cost of the uh, cleanup. I, I am uh, happy to inform uh, Senator um, Watt that as of um, 11 May, uh, I, I believe that about 2,500 out of 3,700 uh, houses had their the debris cleared. About 130 crew across New South Wales are working as we speak. Uh, with about uh, 300 um, uh, houses uh, cleared of debris a week. Um, of course, we, I mean, state authorities, uh, relevant authorities in New South Wales will continue to work as fast as they can. My advice is that most, most debris will be Order. cleared by the end of June and all uh, is expected to be completed by 31 July. In all of the circumstances, including the impact of COVID-19, uh, I would have thought that the Labor Party would understand that we are dealing in a particular circumstance that is more challenging than we envisaged uh, uh, you know, back, in, back in January. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Government figures show that in Snowy Monero, not one out of 119 bushfire-affected properties had been cleared of debris. In Queenbee and Palarang, just one in 13 bushfire-affected properties has been cleared of debris. And in New South Wales, fewer than one in three bushfire-affected properties have been cleared of debris. Why has Mr Morrison failed to live up to his promise to clear New South Wales of bushfire debris by the 30th of June? Senator Cormann. And, and, and here we go. Here, here, we, here, here we see what it's all about. Here, here we see what it's about. Here we can see what it's about. I mean, look, our, our government will continue to do what we can to support New South Wales in working Order. as fast as possible in providing support to bushfire Order. affected communities and in relation, in relation to, um, in relation to uh, cleaning of debris across uh, bushfire affected uh, areas and include in particular in the electorate that uh, Senator Watt uh, has mentioned, uh, I'm advised that by 20 June about 208 um, uh, properties are expected to be cleared, 188 now. Uh, in Snowy Mon Monero, 31 will be cleared by 20 June, 11 today. Um, by in uh, Queen Bee and uh, Palarang, 64 will be cleared by 20 June, 48 today. Um, and in Bega Valley, 431 uh, will be cleared by 20 June, 375 by, you know, as of today. And uh, Euro Bodella, uh, 600 will be cleared by 20 June and uh, 570 by, by today. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Why, when the promised clearing of bushfire debris hasn't happened, small businesses are struggling and bushfire survivors are still living in caravans, is the Prime Minister spending nearly $300,000 on market research on bushfires instead of providing survivors with the immediate support he has promised? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I completely reject the premise of the question. About $1.4 billion worth of funding out of $2 billion uh, is already hitting the ground as we speak. In, in communities and supporting individuals, and that is on top. That is on top of a. That is on top of a whole series of funding already available through existing Order. disaster recovery measures. Uh, you know, like uh, 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 the prime minister works tirelessly every single day, tirelessly every single day, to ensure that communities across Eden Monero and indeed all around Australia uh, receive the support. Uh, that they deserve and that they need through this difficult period. Uh, we have, I mean, certainly the communities in the communities in Monero have been uh, hit hard with bushfires, and of course are also feeling the impact of uh, the coronavirus crisis. And I know that in the Liberal National uh, Morrison McCormack government, uh, they they are getting they are getting uh, order. They're, they're getting a lot of that. They're getting our absolute best support that we can possibly that order, we can possibly Senator deploy. Foreman. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The Australian community has been doing a lot of heavy lifting to ensure they stop the spread of COVID-19. This coalition government 
has been the envy of the world, with the swift measures it took to protect the health of Australians. Can the minister update the Senate on what the government's plan is for opening our state and territory borders? And if we do not, what are the implications for our economy? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator uh, Thank Ford. you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator McMahon for that important question. Uh, our government has been working closely with state and territory governments through the national cabinet process to lift restrictions across the nation in a way which is COVID safe, but as uh, swiftly as possible. Uh, as the federal chief medical officer and deputy chief medical officer have made clear on a number of occasions, there is no medical reason for any state borders to remain closed. In fact, there is no health advice in front of us that state or territory borders need to be closed. The closure of state borders is having a significant negative impact on our economy. With international borders closed, tourism operators will need to rely on domestic holiday makers to fill the void from international tourists. Tourism is worth around 3.1 per cent of our GDP or around $60 billion last financial year. In fact, tourism, the tourism sector, employs around 670,000 Australians or 5.2 per cent of all workers. That is why the longer the state and territory borders stay closed, the bigger the impact on our national economy. The clear three-stage plan to lift restrictions included borders being opened in July. The Prime Minister said that there was a very open and constructive discussion at National Cabinet last Friday about reopening borders, and we're also proposing to work closely with states on a pilot basis to enable international students uh, to come to Australia in a very controlled setting. But clearly, and this is an important point, and I think it's an important point for uh, the uh, people in the Territory, uh, while travel to a state or a territory is not allowed from other parts of Australia, we cannot consider travel to that jurisdiction from overseas. Uh, and if we want to ensure that uh, tourism operators and businesses around Australia have the best possible opportunity to be successful again and to hire uh, more Australians and more Territorians, uh, we need to see those borders come down as swiftly as possible. Senator McMahon, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister inform the Senate if the Commonwealth is aware of when the states and territories, like my Northern Territory, are going to reopen their borders? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. It was agreed at National Cabinet on Friday that all states except WI would look at uh, reopening their borders in July. Uh, this was in line with uh, National Cabinet reconfirming its commitment to the three-step framework for COVID safe Australia to be completed in July 2020. South Australia is committed to reopening uh, their borders from July 20. Queensland was expected to be on track for July reopening, although media reporting is now putting some doubt over that based on comments from Queensland Premier uh, Palushai in their parliament today, Order. where she said that the borders will remain closed, and I'm quoting, Order. while there is active transmission. The Chief Minister of the Northern Territory has indicated he will make an announcement by the end of this week. Tasmania has no date for reopening, and my home state of Western Australia has indicated it will not be reopening its borders in July. The Australian Government is intervening in three High Court cases that challenge the closure of the WA and Queensland state borders. Uh, the Commonwealth Attorney General is intervening to my constitutional arguments in support of opening Order. our state Senator borders. Foreman. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline the coalition government's plan to assist rural and regional economies to return to prosperity post-COVID-19 restrictions? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator McMahon for another very good question. Uh, the coalition government understands the COVID-19 pandemic is having a disproportionate impact on some sectors, regions and communities, including those heavily reliant on industries such as tourism and agriculture. This is why we are providing a $1 billion relief and recovery fund to support regions, communities and industry sectors that have been disproportionately affected. That is why yesterday we announced further infrastructure investments which included $1.5 billion for roads. These roads, this, these roads packages include key investments that help rural and regional Australia such as the beef roads in northern Queensland and the Bustle Highway in Western Australia, roads which will form vital linkage points to ports and to our key markets. Uh, there's still a long way to go in recovering from this once in a hundred year global pandemic, but we are heading in the right direction and we will continue to do all that is necessary 
to ensure Australians and our rural and regional economies have the best possible opportunity to return Order, to prosperity. Senator Coleman, uh, time has expired. Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Oh, no. I refer to the Minister's statements regarding the retention bonus for aged care workers. Yesterday, the Minister said, and I quote, we never said at any point in time that these support bonuses would be tax-free. That was never said. Does the minister concede that his media release of 20 March 2020 described the payments as after tax? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, and at no point in any of those statements that uh, Senator Walsh has just read, I thank you for the question. Uh, uh, in, particularly in my press release, did I say that the uh, bonus would be tax-free? <laughs> Never said that it would be tax-free, uh, and, uh, and that's exactly what I said yesterday. We never, at any point in time, Mr. President, indicated that this bonus would be tax-free. We said uh, at all times, we said at all times that these bonuses would be. Uh, up to $800 and up to $600, order, Senator, but we never Senator, said at Senator any point Colbert, in time— that A point of order, Senator Wong. Uh, direct relevance. It was a very specific question. Does the minister concede that his media release described the payments as after tax? I have um, asked the minister, ask you, to remind the minister of this question. The, the, the minister, at the point you interrupted him, Senator Wong, I believe was actually directly addressing albeit challenging the assertion contained in the question. Now, that is a matter for debate after question time. It's not a matter for me to direct the minister how to answer the question, but I believe he was being directly relevant, and opposition senators can say something after question time in the appropriate slot. Senator Colbeck. Mr President, thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, Senator Wong. Uh, at no point, at no point in time, did the government say that these bonuses would be tax-free? At no point Senator, Senator did Wong, we say they were tax-free. On, on a point of order? Thank you. Yeah. Point of order. Um, I seek leave to table the minister's statement, which says clearly the words "after tax per quarter" on two occasions. I mean, this is becoming a Senator, farce. Senator Question Wong. time should Senator have Wong. some accountability order. associated order. with it. Order. He simply Senator lied. Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Wong, I'm going to ask you to withdraw that particular accusation directed at an individual right, he, senator. He is simply not telling the truth, Mr President. I, I need to, uh, I uh, need, sorry, I withdraw. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Cormann on the point of order. There are some basic courtesies when it comes to tabling of documents. Senator Wong has been here long enough to know. <laughs> on the order. Order. On the point of order. Opposition senators who wish to challenge the minister's answer have an opportunity to do so after question time. This, the, the, the point of I, um, Senator Wong, he is directly addressing the terms of the question, and you have an opportunity to debate it. I cannot direct the minister how to answer a question. I've allowed you to do so, Senator Wong, on two occasions. Um, and, and Senator Wong, the, question, the question, answer can be debated after question time. But as long as the minister is addressing the terms of the question, and he is directly addressing the terms of the question, I do not have the authority to direct him how to answer a question. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, Mr. President, uh, the, the statement in my press release does not mean tax-free, which is the implication Order. that the Labor Party are trying to make. And so the, the two statements are completely and utterly uh, compatible. I, the government at no point indicated that these bonuses would be tax-free, uh, and because that is not the way income bonuses work. They are clearly subject to tax, because at no point in time did we say they would be tax-free. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, can the minister assist the Senate by telling us what he thinks the words "after tax" mean? Senator Colbeck. Mr. Mr. President, the words "after tax" do not mean tax-free. Clearly, do not mean tax-free. And, Mr. President, we, at no point in time, the government, at no point in time, said that these bonuses would be tax-free. Mr. President. 
And quite frankly, I am very proud of the fact that this government recognised a Senator particular Pratt. sector of the Australian workforce to provide them with Senator, additional. Me, Senator Watt, on a point of order. Of order is relevance. We just want to know what after tax means. Sorry, Senator um, Watt, I, I believe the minister is here. He, is being directly relevant. I will listen carefully. He's 27 seconds in. Um, he was asked about what a term means, and he is actually directly addressing in that particular part of the question, which was the only part of the question. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, uh, only the Labor Party could make a full glass sound as though it's empty. This government made a very deliberate decision to provide support to aged care workers during the COVID-19 pandemic because of the circumstance they found them in, themselves in. And we said we, that they were important to the government, they were important to the community, and so we made a decision to provide up to $800 and up to $600 for residential aged care workers and home care workers to support them through the COVID-19 pandemic. Senator Walsh, final supplementary question. Why did the minister's press release use the phrase after tax if not to suggest that these bonuses would be tax free? Why does the minister find it so hard to own up to his mistakes? Senator Colbert. Mr. President, as I said, uh, thanks, Senator uh, Walsh, for the supplementary question. Uh, as I said in my previous answer, after tax does not mean tax free. It's a very, very simple statement. It's a very, very Senator simple, Pratt. It's a very simple statement, Mr. President, and I'm very proud of the fact that this government provided support to residential aged care workers and home care workers. In fact, this group of workers is the only group of workers in the Australian economy that was provided with direct support to recognise the work that they do through the, pand the coronavirus can pandemic, in recognition, Mr. President, of the fact that their work is so important in, in the care of senior Australians. A very specific decision, Mr. President, to support residential and home care workers to, to look after senior Australians through the pandemic because of the importance of the work that they do. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Family and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister advise the Senate what the Morrison government is doing to support Australia's oldest Australians and guaranteeing essential services for our seniors, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic? Minister. Um, families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much to Senator Smith for his question. Uh, and also, can I um, thank him for the recognition of the commitment that we all have to making sure that we support older Australians uh, within our communities, particularly uh, recognising the significant contribution that older Australians make to our co economy and to our society, and recognising also the impact that the COVID. Uh, pandemic has had on all Australians, particularly our older Australians. So it was with, uh, we were, were pleased to be able to, uh, to put into place for all eligible pensioners and uh, seniors two payments of $750 in addition uh, to any other payments that they were receiving to help them with the economic and the costs associated with the pandemic. So on the, as of the 31st of uh, March 2020, the first round of these payments went out. Uh, and were successfully delivered um, to 3.4 million Australian pensioners, uh, as well as 170,000 carers who were on carer allowance, 230,000 uh, veterans payments and Commonwealth gold card holders, as well as 375,000 uh, Commonwealth seniors health, ca health care card holders. The second payment will be made in July and will be made to those people who have not been in receipt of the coronavirus supplement. Um, additionally, we have also recognised that, that with very low interest rates, um, that deeming rates needed to be reduced. So around 900,000 Australians who were living on incomes, who were income support, uh, recipients who also had uh, uh, amounts of uh, liquid assets in excess of the, uh, the uh, acceptable levels or the, the uh, threshold levels, also received a drop in their deeming rates. And these reflected the lower uh, interest rates in the economy. Uh, equally, we have been very keen to make sure that our pension and loan scheme is available to older Australians so that they can, in effect, reverse mortgage their properties to make sure they can Order have the Senator additional Rustin. money. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister update the Senate on what initiatives the government has implemented to support our senior Australians? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, we know that about a third of our senior Australians live alone, and with social distancing and the measures that we've had to put in place over the coronavirus uh, pandemic, has mean, meant that many of them are relying on different ways to become connected. So, connecting online or on the phone is especially important at this time for our older Australians, and that's why we have put additional funds in to two particular initiatives to help prevent loneliness and social isolation for older Australians. The first is a $5 million package to significantly expand the Friends Line, which is a telephone line. It's free and it's anonymous, and it allows older Australians to chat with a friendly volunteer about whatever issue may be concerning them. Um, and the funding will boost the line to allow an extra 15,000 calls to be answered uh, um, in the period. Uh, in addition, we've put another million dollars uh, into a program called Be Connected, where older Australians who find themselves with technology that may not be able to, to be used or they don't have any a mobile phone or, or a Order, computer— Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Smith, final supplementary. Can the minister advise the Senate how the government is supporting our volunteers, especially our senior volunteers? Senator, Rust Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Um, senior volunteers make up a very significant proportion of Australian volunteers. Uh, and we know that during the COVID pandemic, many of our older Australians have chosen not to continue to volunteer um, because of health risks or accessibility. Um, and that saw a significant decline uh, in the number of people that were volunteering. And we understand the significant impact this makes on our economy. Um, and for that reason, we have made sure that we've continued to be able to put measures in place, including awarding uh, a number of 2,698 grants um, across uh, and a number of areas, but across a lot of organisations, between $1,000 and $5,000 to be able to help them. Um, and we'd like to particularly thank Volunteers Australia and acknowledge all of Australia's volunteers and the amazing job that they do, because we know that the, uh, the economic benefits and the yield that all Australians and Australia receives from volunteering is absolutely immense, and we thank them. Order. Senator Rustin. Senator Cormann. I ask that further questions be placed in the notice paper. I ask senators to pause for a moment. I have received a message from the House of Representatives returning the Crimes Legislation Amendment Sexual Crimes Against Children and Community Protection Measures Bill 2019 and informing the Senate that the House has agreed to amendment numbers one and three and disagreed to amendment number two made by the Senate. Minister. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I move that the message be considered in committee of the whole immediately. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Oh, Senator McKim, sorry, I didn't see you. Uh, well, thank you, President. Are you, um, are you speaking to the consideration of the of the to the consideration whether we should go into committee to consider in, it? Indeed. Yes, indeed. Senator McKim. Um, well, it's quite unusual for um, the government to make uh, this suggestion in a motion uh, immediately after the minute before uh, the Senate has had uh, an opportunity um, to consider at any length at all. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the position of the House and uh, the request um, from the House. Now, uh, what we do know is that in the other place today, Labor uh, backflipped uh, and has abandoned its opposition to mandatory sentencing. And uh, you know, I can hear some uh, some interjections from. Uh, coalition senators here that, uh, that say that that's exactly what the Labor Party um, should do. And I'll, I'll address this in, uh, in more detail when, uh, when we get into the committee. But I do want to uh, simply make the point here that this is an unseemly haste from the government, and I expect that the Labor Party, in fact, is going to support this motion because it's embarrassed at its backflip. And so it should be embarrassed uh, at its backflip because, in fact, um, the backflip that Labor uh, is engaged in here today, uh, firstly, is in direct contravention to its own policy. Labor's policy says this, Labor opposes mandatory sentencing, and so Labor should oppose mandatory sentencing. And so Labor did oppose mandatory sentencing yesterday in this parliament, when in fact they joined with the Australian Greens and members of the crossbench 
to reject the mandatory sentencing provisions of this legislation. Yet here we are today, with Labor having backflipped in the House and supported the mandatory sentencing provisions uh, of this legislation, and now I have no doubt helping the government ram this legislation through the parliament today. Now, let's be very clear about what this legislation does. Should it be successful, which it now will, thanks to this appalling backflip and walk away from its own policy by the Labor Party, is placed at significant risk teenagers in Australia engaging in what over human history has been quite normal teenage behaviour. And I'll take that interjection. I don't know whether Hansard picked it up. I'll take that interjection from Senator, Senator McKim. Platt. Senator McKim, just while we're on that interjection, I just remind you: you really need to be debating the substance of whether we go into committee or not. Thank you. Thank you, uh, um, uh, thank you, uh, Deputy President. And I will address these matters um, uh, once we go. Uh, once we go into the committee, but I'm making the point that the sooner this legislation goes through the parliament, which it now will, thanks to the Labor Party, the higher the risk that teenage people in Australia will be sentenced to four, five, six or in some cases seven years imprisonment for engaging in uh, what through human history has been relatively normal um, teenage behaviour. And uh, the only rebuttal that the government has to this allegation is that we can all relax because there is prosecutorial discretion and that prosecutors will not prosecute if it is not in the public interest to do so. And I say to the government and I say to the Labor Party, tell that to Mr Bernard Caleri. Tell that to Witness Kay. Tell Senator, that Senator to the McKim, innumerable whistleblowers McKim, that have been prosecuted in this place. Thank you. Uh, Minister. Just put the question. Uh, I move that the question be put. So the question is, uh, so we're debating uh, whether or not to go into committee. So the question to be, uh, yes, the question is that now be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. So the question is that the closure motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith as teller for the ayes and Senator Seawitt as teller for the noes. Order, there being 41 ayes and eight noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. So the next motion is that the message be considered in committee of the whole immediately. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I move that the committee does not insist uh, on its amendment to which the House of Representatives has disagreed. And in uh, doing so, I uh, urge the Senate not to insist on its amendment. This amendment, if insisted upon, uh, would remove Schedule 6 of the bill, which provides for mandatory minimum sentences for child sex offences that attract the highest penalties and to recidivist child sex offenders who have previously been convicted of a child sex offence. Current sentencing practices for Commonwealth child sex offences are resulting in manifestly inadequate sentences that do not sufficiently recognise the harm suffered by victims of child sex offences or provide for adequate rehabilitation time in custody. Between 1 February 2014 and 31 January 2019, approximately 40 per cent of Commonwealth child sex offenders were not sentenced to spend a single day in prison. In the last five years, the most common length of imprisonment for Commonwealth child sex offence was 18 months, with the most common non-parole period or fixed term period being six months or less. Many sentences for Commonwealth child sex offenders are applied on the basis of being manifestly inadequate. The mandatory minimum provisions provided for in Schedule 6 are necessary to achieve the Bill's intent of ensuring sentencing for child sex offences are in line with community expectations. To, to reiterate, the provisions do not impose mandatory non-parole periods. Judicial discretion is maintained on setting the minimum period in custody and minimum penalties can be reduced where an offender pleads guilty and cooperates with law enforcement agencies. The mandatory sentencing provisions of this bill do not apply to offenders who are under 18 when they commit an offence. I repeat this. The mandatory sentencing provisions of this bill do not apply to offenders who are under 18 when they commit an offence. I urge the Senate to not insist on its amendment to remove Schedule 6. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. As I outlined in my second reading speech uh, on the original debate on this bill, there is a lot that this bill gets right, and Labor will always work with MPs and senators from all sides of politics to strengthen our laws to protect our children. Nothing should get in the way of this objective. There is nothing more sickening than child sexual abuse. Children are the most precious and vulnerable members of our community and Labor will always support strong and effective laws to protect children from abuse and to punish their abusers. From the very beginning, 
Labor has signalled our strong support for the key measures in this bill, including significant increases to maximum penalties, the introduction of a presumption against bail for serious Commonwealth child sex offences, the replacement of the existing definition of child pornography material with a broader definition of child abuse material in various acts, and the introduction of new grooming offences. And, given our support for those measures, Labor has also made it clear that, whether our amendments succeeded or failed, we would support this bill. That is what Labor did in the Senate last night. Labor supported the bill. For that reason, while we maintain our opposition to mandatory sentencing because it doesn't work and makes it harder to catch, prosecute and convict criminals, we will not insist on our amendments. Protecting the welfare of children will always be Labor's overriding priority and concerns. Given some of the commentary over the last 12 hours, I'd like to conclude by reading a statement from Sonia Ryan, the founder and CEO of the Carly Ryan Foundation. This statement was issued this morning, and it is something that all of us in this place and the other place should reflect on carefully. The statement reads as follows. This bill will genuinely help so many people and so many victims of crime. There is no question that we want child sex offenders put away for a long time and off the streets. This is an absolute given. As a mother who has lost a child through the actions of a heinous child sex offender, I implore all sides of government work together, compromise and pass this bill as soon as possible with or without mandatory sentencing. Victims of crime, innocent children, the Australian community are looking for leaders who will stand up for those who cannot defend themselves, who put political battles aside for the greater good of humanity, who are able to push their egos aside and do what's right. As we see it, there are two practical options. One, pass this legislation with mandatory sentencing and a review in three years. Two, pass this legislation without mandatory sentencing and work with the judiciary to increase sentencing overall and make sure adequate sentences are being applied with a review in three years. Either way, our children win. This is a huge step in the fight against those who wish to harm families. On that basis, I commend the bill to the Senate. Senator McKim. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Deputy President. If I could just first uh, address a matter that I've spoken to Senator Cormann about, and that is to acknowledge that the government did uh, inform uh, our team that, in fact, this matter would be proceeded with now, uh, except that message did not receive, uh, did not make its way to us in the chamber due to a technical issue. So uh, that's the reason we um, voted against. Uh, the previous motion put by Senator Cormann, and we don't want in the Australian Greens this bill to be unnecessarily held up because we uh, share the view, just espoused uh, by Senator Watt, that there is a lot in this bill, as I said in my second reading contributions yesterday, which is meritorious uh, and which is supported by the Australian Greens. Um, now that the government has uh, shifted its position and, uh, and uh, accepted the necess necessity of a three-year review into that legislation that took care of one of the concerns uh, that the Greens uh, articulated yesterday and that was encapsulated uh, in one of the amendments that we put yesterday. Uh, however, unlike the Labor Party, we still believe and stand to our position that uh, mandatory sentencing should not be in this legislation, and that's because it creates the very real potential for miscarriages of justice. And I accept uh, the assurance Senator Cormann has just given, which was also given by the government yesterday, that this bill, uh, the mandatory sentencing provisions of this bill, do not uh, uh, people under the age of 18 will not be caught by those provisions. However. You can still be a teenager and be over the age of 18, and if there is a teenager just over the age of 18 who engages uh, in various um, behaviours that are caught by this legislation with a partner who is under the age of 16, even by one day, then that person, who could just be one or two days over the age of 18, will be caught by the mandatory sentencing provisions of this legislation. 
It is absolutely critical to the Australian Greens that judges be left to impose sentences based on their consideration of the merits of each individual case which come before those judges. That's why we pay them the big dollars. That's why we have an independent judiciary, so that justice can be done and we retain the concerns that we articulated yesterday that this will create the very real possibility of significant miscarriages of justice and result in teenage year old Australians being imprisoned for, uh, in some circumstances, seven years, seven years, with the judges being given um, no real discretion to reduce those sentences, except in the case of the guilty plea, which can only reduce the sentence by 25 per cent under the provisions of this legislation. So we do not believe um, that uh, the Senate uh, should not insist on its amendments. We believe that the Senate should assist, insist on its amendments. The government could then accept that in the lower house and have the rest of this bill passed today if the government was so minded. So this is not delaying um, the enactment of this bill or the royal assent to this bill in any way whatsoever if the government would simply remove its ideological commitment to mandatory sentencing. This matter could proceed. We could remove the only elements of this bill now that are not supported by the Australian Greens, which are the mandatory sentencing provisions. And the rest of this legislation, which has the full support of the Australian Greens, could pass through the parliament today. Thank you, Senator McKim. So the question is, as moved by the minister that the committee does not insist on its amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Okay. I didn't hear any opposition, so I'm happy to put the motion again. So the question is that the committee does not insist on its amendments. The motion is moved by the minister is that the committee does not insist on its amendments. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. Um, before I put the motion, I am assuming that all senators standing are participating in the vote. So the question is that the committee does not insist on its amendments. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith as teller for the ayes and Senator Seward as teller for the noes. Order. There being 44 ayes and 8 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Yeah, oh, sorry. Minister. Thank you very much. I move that the resolution of the committee be reported. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Uh, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The committee has considered message number 220 from the House of Representatives relating to the crimes legislation amendment, sexual crimes against children and community protection measures bill 2019 has, and has resolved not to insist on the amendments made by the Senate to which the House has disagreed. Minister. Okay. Okay, so we've finished with that matter. We're going to move to motions to take note. I'll just let those who are leaving the chamber depart and others to return to their correct sides. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. I rise to take note of, the, of a, the answers given by Senators Cormann and Rustin to the questions asked by Senators uh, Wong and Gallagher. For anyone that was uh, hoping to be able to get some answers or clarity um, from the government today, they would have been sorely disappointed from the answers that we've received in question time. What we see uh, again is um, the government um, not providing that clarity, the government having no detail around what they call their snap back strategy, which is, is becoming clearer that it is indeed a flawed snap back strategy. More Australians than were expected have been forced onto job seeker. 140,000 Australians, to be exact, and the government um, may refuse to acknowledge this, but of course it is unfortunately true. 
And I know um, many senators and members have been receiving a number of calls, emails, asking what is going to happen, what will happen post-September, because they're so concerned. And we can't, we're unable to give them any clarity as to what this government is going to do. You must know this. The government senators must know this. They must be receiving these calls. They must be receiving emails from people that are desperate to be understand exactly what is going to happen post-September. We didn't receive any clarity from the Prime Minister, and we certainly didn't receive any clarity from Senator Cormann here today. You know, we've got an a, a extra, well, unfortunately, 140,000 um, more Australians being forced onto JobSeeker, but it's also <coughs> true that a high number of people on JobSeeker is a result is a result of the bungled handling of the job keeper program. Now the government thought that 1.5 million would, would be on job seeker by June this year. But figures released to the COVID committee revealed that there's 1.64 million people currently receiving job seeker payment. Now why more Australians have been forced onto unemployment benefits, local employees, industries that may need help from the government to stay afloat aren't getting the help. And they're, again, they're not even getting any clarity. So they're not getting the help they need from the government. Local go governments that operate regional airports aren't allowed to claim JobKeeper. Our tertiary education sector are not allowed to claim JobKeeper. And our childcare and early education sectors have been told by the government that they will be the first industry to snap back. Hard working Australians that have worked for the same company for 20 years, 20 years have been told that they aren't eligible for JobKeeper either, despite the fact that they've been doing the same job at the same place for decades. Along the way, the company they worked for was sold to an overseas company. For this reason, and for this reason alone, the government has chosen to punish these hard-working Australians and deny them and their employer access to JobKeeper. This is a real blow to these workers. A real blow. This really is a shocking way, Madam Deputy President, to treat our fellow Australians. The government's blunders and decision to make our childcare uh, and ch childcare and childhood education sector snap back will be particularly hard on women. 96% of the workforce in that sector are female. Women have been at the forefront of tackling the pa uh, pandemic. They've cared for Australians that are ill. They've worked hard to keep our workplaces, our schools, our public spaces safe and clean. They've looked after us older Australians and cared for and educated our young people. So what do we have from this government? We've had a bungled uh, implementation of the JobKeeper. We've had uh, thank you, Senator Brown. Your time has expired. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Mac Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, President sorry. Uh, uh, part of me feels a little sorry uh, for the opposition at the moment. I, I know it's their job. It's their job to come into this place and hold the government to account. It's their job to uh, be a critic, effectively, of uh, what's happening. But. But they are really, really clutching at straws uh, at the moment. Uh, uh, they are struggling a little uh, uh, to be uh, a critic uh, uh, through this uh, crisis. You can, you can tell they're struggling a little bit. You can, you can tell uh, their desperation uh, by the fact that they're complaining about things not that we have done, but that we might do. 
Uh, most of Senator Brown's contribution there was not about what the government has done, the decisions it's made to help and assist uh, Australians that have uh, been affected by the coronavirus pandemic and its uh, associated economic downturn. Most of the criticisms there that were put by Senator Brown were about things we might do in a few months' time uh, if and when conditions improve, improve and hopefully improve, and we no longer need uh, this assistance. Uh, uh, it's a relatively, it's a pretty weak argument to be putting here that uh, they might do something bad to you in the future, so be very, very worried. Well, I think Australians actually know uh, that the best, best way uh, to judge uh, somebody, a best way to judge uh, a horse in a race or, 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 or uh, a business that you're frequenting or a government that you're looking to, uh, to assess and judge, the best way to judge people is on their form, on their record, what they have done, uh, not what they uh, might do, uh, not what they, you might fear them to do. It's uh, the record of what they've actually done. And what the government has actually done over these last three months has respond, uh, has, to, has to been to respond uh, quickly uh, and generously uh, to the conditions that some Australians find themselves in through no fault of their own. Through no fault of their own. Uh, it is true, as Senator Brown has uh, highlighted, that millions of Australians have been put out of work, millions of Australians uh, have seen their incomes reduced, thousands of Australian businesses have seen uh, their futures been thrown into great uncertainty or, in the worst case, uh, cases, have their businesses closed and shut because of this coronavirus. Uh, uh, and every step of the way, the government has been there to uh, increase uh, assistance and support uh, to those who are suffering. We, of course, can't make everybody whole. Uh, we, of course, uh, cannot uh, uh, replace uh, uh, or completely make up for the loss and suffering that some have suffered uh, through these past few months. But we have done everything a government can do uh, to help and assist those in need. Uh, it has required, of course, uh, uh, decisions, tough decisions at times, to balance things up, like those we recently made around the childcare sector, where uh, our initial support was tailored towards what we thought would be a significant reduction in childcare numbers, a significant reduction in the utilisation of childcare services. Uh, uh, but of course, in fact, that did not occur, uh, with childcare places, I think, uh, uh, being north of 70 per cent or so, uh, even through coronavirus. And therefore, we've changed tack. We've changed tack and adjusted the assistance to the circumstances which have eventuated here uh, in that sector, and that's been welcomed by the sector. And that's the only real criticism the, the, the opposition has of the government: is, well, you've, things, have, things haven't always turned out as planned. That, that not as many people are on job keeper as you predicted. It's not costing as much as you thought. That more people are on job seeker than was predicted. Uh, that we've had to change our policies on childcare. But of course, that is a function. Those change circumstances. Things change quickly, of course, as a function of a crisis like this. A crisis like this, a global pandemic, is not going to be a predictable one. A global pandemic like this will have fast-changing aspects to it that no one could predict because a few months ago there was so much uncertainty about how this pandemic would eventuate, how bad the health impacts would be, how many people would be infected, etc. etc. Uh, all of the policies we've designed have been designed in a way uh, to respond to those changing circumstances. All of them, uh, we have stated, will be uh, temporary. We can't keep spending over $10 billion a month on, on JobKeeper. We can't keep providing the same level of assistance forever and put it on the credit card. So all of them have been decided in this responsive way, and that's what we will continue to do for the Australian people. And the Australian people can trust us, as we have in the last few months, to stand with them, alleviate suffering where we can, and do so in a responsible and common sense way. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Stirl. Thanks, uh, Deputy President. Just stick around, Senator Canavan, because I'll tell you something that you've done. Don't worry about that. You should really stick around if you absolutely care Senator about Stirl, Australian workers. Senator Stirl, I remind workers. you to not reflect on whether senators are in the chamber or not. Thank you. And, as I was saying, Senator Canavan should stick around and listen quite clearly, because I'm going to talk about a group of workers. Five and a half thousand in this nation that have been absolutely treated appalling by the government. And they're not blue collar, steel cap, booted union big men with loud voices. 
the majority of them are women and they're the donato workers. And for those senators sitting opposite, and I know you don't have to say, you're not in the cabinet, I understand that, but these are the people that clean the aircraft that you and I fly on every week. That's right. These are the same people. And we see them when we're getting off the plane, whether it's midnight, whether it's five o'clock in the morning we're getting on, the ones with the buckets, the ones with the gloves, the ones with the plastic bins, all waiting to come on the aircraft to clean the aircraft that we've been sitting on there and we've had a pretty comfortable flight. These are also the same workers who put together the food or the nibbles or the drinks that are served on our planes throughout Australia every flight. They're the same ones who make sure that the trays have got water in them. They're the same ones that are there to make sure there's colouring in pencils and there's books for the poor kids down the back that are screaming and not enjoying the flight. These are Five and a half thousand Australian workers who work in the, in the catering kitchens, the former Qantas flight catering. There's the same people that prepare the food. There's the chefs, there's the cooks, there's the pot washers, there's the cutlery bench, every single bit going day in, day out, making sure that Australia's aviation industry is not only effective but it's also viable and it's comfortable and it's enjoyable. They're also the same ones that do it on all the international flights. Not a different bunch of workers, it's the same workers. These are the same workers and predominantly women who all at one stage worked for Qantas or Alpha Catering. Remember that proud Australian airline Qantas? The one that couldn't wait to come off and sell it off to Donata. And I appeal to my colleagues across the bench. These are not foreign workers. They're Australians. They bought, most of them are born here. Or they, they made their home here. They've, their kids go to the same shopping centres as we go to. They, they go to, sorry, the same shopping centres. Their kids go to the same schools. They pay their taxes here in Australia. It's just because the government actually allowed at Qantas's request to have their employer go from the proud Australian, who at many times has tried to water down the 51 per cent Australian ownership to suit their, their, their very high paid officials at the top of the tree. Australians. And they're not being told they can't have JobKeeper, nor can they get JobSeeker, because they're in an industry that's not worthy. They're being told they can't have it by the government because their employer is a foreign entity. How do you think they feel? And I have, no, I have absolutely no doubt that you've seen the protests, you've seen their submissions, you've seen their approaches. And here's one of the worst things. I actually attended, I attended two rallies in Perth for the Donata workers. And one of the rallies was at the Attorney General's office. All they wanted to do was present a letter to the Attorney General to say, Dear Attorney General, when you're next in Cabinet, can you please consider us Aussies who aren't getting this money? We're not, foreigner, uh, we're not foreigners. It's just our company was sold to a foreign entity. The sad part is Minister Porter wasn't there. Christian Porter, Minister Porter, he wasn't there. And they walked in, they knocked on the door, they walked into the office, they presented the letter saying, please, can we put our case to you? And the lady in Mr Porter's office, I'm told, was very, very, very well-mannered and very accommodating, and they walked out. Ten minutes later, I'm sitting there and I said to the Secretary of the Transport Workers' Union, I said, mate, you might want to go out there and say hello. I said, but I've just seen four police car two police cars turned up, four, four uh, policemen, two Australian Federal Police, and I said, and I know the two detectives sitting here because I've seen them before. I've called the coppers and said there's a violent demonstration. Most of the people there, the Donata workers, were women who stand about five foot two high. I couldn't believe it. And they're still, I asked uh, Timmy Dawson the other day as he got a response, to this day, still not even the decency of a response from Christian Porter. Thank you, Senator Stirl. Your time has expired. Senator Scar. Madam uh, Deputy President, uh, first uh, I acknowledge uh, Senator Stirl's contribution to the debate and um, place on the record my sympathies for the Donata workers. The unfortunate issue is that um, not only are they owned by a foreign entity, but they're owned by a foreign, a foreign entity which is controlled 100 per cent by a foreign government. And uh, as Senator Steele knows, the legislation we passed in this place some time ago 
uh, to deal with uh, the JobKeeper payments. It excluded payments to wholly owned foreign entities owned by foreign government. But uh, I do uh, acknowledge the comments he made. With respect to Senator Brown's contribution, I must say uh, it perplexes me how Senator Brown can think that uh, there was any confusion whatsoever with respect to what was going to happen with JobKeeper and JobSeeker. When we passed the legislation here in this chamber some months ago, it was clear that both measures were intended to last for six months. That was absolutely clear. So I'm not sure why there's some confusion when the government has simply stated that it intends to maintain that course. I'm, I'm not sure where the confusion is coming from. The government has been absolutely clear in that respect. Let me also say that I have the absolute sympathy, absolute sympathy for all of those workers at the moment who are on either JobKeeper or JobSeeker, because uh, that reflects that the businesses for whom they work are not in a position to trade as they were trading before the coronavirus pandemic. And I'd say to Senator Brown, if she's concerned about those workers, if she's concerned about those workers, if they're located in Queensland, please pick up the phone and talk to the Premier of my home state, Premier Palaszczuk. Talk to Premier Palaszczuk and give her three messages. I'll even write the messages for you. Give her three messages. First, open the borders. Open the borders so the tourism industry can get back on its feet again. Open the borders. Just today, Premier Palaszczuk appears to be backsliding, backsliding on the July 10 date. Backsliding. The tourism industry doesn't want to hear that. The tourist, tourism industry in my home state of Queensland wants to get up and running again. It wants to take advantage of that winter tourism season. And Premier Palaszczuk again is making comments in the Queensland Parliament during question time that she's concerned that. Oh, yes, uh, just a moment. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator point, of, point of order, Madam Deputy President. Could I remind the member that we're taking note on the questions that were asked by Senator Cormann, oh, se sorry, Senator Wong to Senator Cormann and um, Senator Rustin. Those were the points. We're not talking about the Queensland government and borders. We're actually talking about the questions that were asked in question time. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. It is a, it is a wide-ranging debate, and Senator Scar started off on that footing. And I'm listening very carefully. I expect he'll go back to uh, those taking note responses. Thank so you, Senator He will, Scar. absolutely. And he'll go back on the basis that we could have more certainty. We could have more certainty that was sought from those sitting opposite with respect to JobKeeper and JobSeeker if we had more certainty as to when the borders were going to open. The two are linked. The two are linked because employment prospects, employment prospects of both people coming off JobKeeper and, and coming off JobSeeker are linked to the opening of the borders. The two are entwined. The two are absolutely entwined. They're connected. They're related to each other. It's relevant. It's absolutely relevant. Absolutely relevant. Absolutely relevant. This, this government could not have done a better job in terms of dealing with this one in 100 year event than it has. And the facts demonstrate that. This country, Australia, is in the bottom three of countries across the whole world, the bottom three in terms of the lowest rate in terms of GDP for. The bottom three. That's how well we've done. That's how well we've done as a country. That's how well we've done. No government anywhere has done a better job than this government in terms of protecting lives and protecting livelihoods. Protecting lives and protecting livelihoods. And just this week, We've heard how the government is going to be fast-tracking a number of infrastructure projects. And that's all about getting people off JobKeeper back, their companies back running in accordance with normal trading conditions, and getting people off JobSeeker. That's how you provide the certainty. That's how you provide the certainty and get people off JobKeeper and their companies' normal trading conditions and get people off job, JobSeeker and back into work. We're on common ground in that respect. We all want to see that happen. We all want to see that happen. But the reality is there are things that in my home state of Queensland, Anastasia Palaszczuk, Premier Palaszczuk, 
is backsliding on opening the borders, and that has a negative impact, a negative impact on people coming off JobSeeker. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. And I rise this afternoon also to take note of the answers that, you know, as Senator Urquhart uh, mentioned earlier, by uh, Senator Wong to Senator Cormann and Senator Rustin uh, today, with respect to the topics of JobKeeper and JobSeeker. And it is sad to say that the answers that we've received from government, front bench and back bench, today were simply not good enough. Not good enough for Australians. Not good enough for those who are living paycheck to paycheck, and in some cases those that are simply running out of money in their bank accounts. And in homes right across our country, people are feeling confused and uncertain about their future. But that's hardly a surprise, given that they get this and have been receiving this uncertainty now for seven years under the coalition government. Labor did support the JobKeeper and JobSeeker legislation, but we did so on the understanding that government would also come to the table in good faith, that they would also review elements as things progressed and as the situation with respect to coronavirus changed. And that simply has not been the case. This program so far has been poorly implemented, and it's left millions, millions of people, Australian workers, taxpayers, without any support. Casual workers, people who work in retail, in hospitality, fast food, warehousing, and many others, and as we heard from Senator Stirl earlier, those workers in Donata. And all they want is the same support that their fellow Australians are receiving right now. They're not after much. They just want help. They need help so that they too can pay for their bills, put food on the table, have the heater on at home. But now millions of Australians with just a few pay packets away, are losing that's, um, their support. And for tens of thousands of others, in particular those in the childhood education sector, the end of JobKeeper is now just less than one month away. And this is despite the government promising on multiple occasions that they would look after them. Simply not the case. Now we've got 2.3 million more Australians who are on support payments offered by government. But this government is still proposing to slash these payments in half, leaving them around $550 a fortnight worse off. Ripping back the support of JobKeeper and JobSeeker will do untold damage, not to just many Australians at home, but to our economy, and it just does not make any sense. Austerity it does not work, but yet this government seems to be hell-bent on making sure that the fiscal bottom line of the budget is in order, rather than the homes and the household budgets of Australian families. Yesterday, in the other place, the Prime Minister acknowledged that winding back JobKeeper will see more job losses. Support for Australians and Australian jobs is what will make our economy continue to tick over and function and get recovery back on track. I'm deeply concerned about what will happen to my home state in Victoria after September. There are enormous numbers of people who will be left behind by this government. And Senator Wong just simply wanted a very straight answer from Senator Cormann. What is the government's plan post-September? so we can give Australians certainty, certainty so when they plan for their household budgets, it's not just something that gets switched on or off as like a, a flick of a switch. We need to give people the notice and the respect that they deserve so they can start planning for their futures. Do they need to start looking for other work, increasing their hours, making the tough decisions so that they can support their families post-September? We don't need more announcements or press conferences or media doorstops. 
We just need the government to come to the table and say that they will do the right thing and support Australians and Australian jobs. Uh, thank you, Senator Ciccone. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Brown be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given to my question to uh, Senator Birmingham, who is representing the Environment Minister. Of course, this government has always had it in for the environment. This government has always wanted to find a way to weaken environmental protections. And you've got a question, really, how much weaker can they get? We've got a situation where one million hectares of koala habitat in this country has been destroyed. We have koalas in this country in some parts that are endangered. We have mines that are given approval only then to contaminate water catchment areas. And of course, we have the devastating and shocking destruction of 46,000-year-old ancient Aboriginal heritage. And this has happened under this government's watch. This has happened under the laws that are currently in place. And what we've seen from the Prime Minister this week, and the subject of my question to Senator Birmingham, was that the Prime Minister wants to weaken these laws even more. He wants to fast-track projects, developments, mining operations Hello. Hello. so that they can get going faster and bypass environmental regulation cut corners. The Prime Minister calls it cutting green tape. It's cutting corners is what it is. It's cutting environmental protection. And as the government tries to argue that reducing the regulations, cutting regulations, will somehow not result in weakening laws, just beggars belief. No one believes that. It doesn't make any sense. Oh. They want guaranteed approval processes. That's what they're after. We need environmental protections and laws in this country that actually protect the environment. Australia has one of the worst extinction rates in the world for our native animals. We have land clearing that's continuing at such a rate that our native animals are just losing their homes day by day, month by month. And in many cases, we have Australian wildlife and animals that are now so badly endangered that they're on the brink of extinction. And during the summer's bushfires, Australians were shocked at the destruction of our environment. They grieve for the death of our wildlife. They want the government to do more to protect our favourite places, to protect our forests, to keep our beaches clean, to look after our coastline, to keep our rivers, our streams, our lakes clean and healthy. They want less pollution. Australians know that too much of our nature has been trashed in the name of profit, and they want a change from business as usual. This government wants to cut the protections to the environment even more. I asked the minister today whether he could guarantee that this cutting of regulations that in cutting these regulations, whether he could guarantee that no more koala habitat would be destroyed. Well, he couldn't answer the question because he can't guarantee it, because this government is about to sign off on a set of rules that allow for more koala habitat to be destroyed. No checks and balances, 
or very little. I asked the minister whether he could guarantee that no more ancient historical sacred sites would be blasted and blown up like Rio Tinto did only a couple of weeks ago. Well, they can't guarantee that either. In fact, putting in less protections, weakening the laws, cutting, allowing companies and corporations to cut corners when it comes to environmental, their environmental application process is, is going to put Australia's nature, our environment and our native animals Order. Senator Hanson Young, time has at the expired. brink of extinction. The question is: the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it.